here again today and um, I, I would like very much to talk about practical tools to do value investing. Um, and I have um, an hour and I have 29 slides. So I'm going to go really fast. Um, and the first uh, part is background and setting the stage for investing in general and then more specifically value investing. And then into how we pick and select securities, um, portfolio construction, et cetera, to build portfolios. Um, and then if, you're, if we have a bit of time and you're interested, I, I believe in something called macro value investing. I believe that financial market history has a lot to teach us about investing and can really add to your, not, your ability to invest, particularly um, in this changing interest rate inflationary environment. And then I finally have a little section on why Canada now. I think it's an extraordinary good time to invest in Canada and it's likely going to be an amazing decade. So I'm upset that investors are a little bit too into global and trying to drag them back to get the benefits of being in Canada at the moment. So in order to begin talking about investing, I think it's important to talk about the psychology of investing. I think one of the best ways to do that is by using cartoons. This is an old cartoon. I'm sure almost all of you have seen it in the past. It starts off with a trading room and uh, people are listening into each other, which is what happened on trading floors when we used to have them. And uh, somebody hears somebody say, you know, I've got a stock here that could really excel. Um, and next thing you know, a you know, broken telephone, it becomes sell. And then there's a rip snorting bear market. Um, and then somebody throws their hat on their head and says, you know, I can't take this madness anymore. I'm going to leave. Goodbye. And then broken telephone, that becomes a buy market. And that's not far off the truth. And I think that, you know, you know philosophers centuries ago were attempted to explain human behavior. Um, and they found that there was this pesky problem that human beings were basically and essentially irrational. And because of that, we weren't very predictable. And so almost every theory they had had to assume that humans were forecastable and predictable. And um, so, you know, they have to assume that we're not human to be able to attempt in some way to understand us. Um, and then I, I think that we're also um, hurting animals, social animals, and we're captured by crowd behavior. And so we're always curious what other people are doing, and this is what leads and contributes to speculative manias overall in the marketplace. So here you have, you know, a train full of people who are in the stock market. The lone wolf on the precipice wonders whether the people on the train are smarter than they are and whether they need to get in because the crowd seems to be in the game. And meanwhile, everyone on the train is wondering whether that sole hedge fund guy on the precipice is the brilliant one who's doing the right thing. So we often go into manias and funks together. And so how do you counter this element within the marketplace? And I think it's by using a discipline. And in particular, I like to use the discipline of value investing, which means in the end that the real true north for me is what's the price you're paying for the stock that you're buying today? And are you buying it at a bargain? And are you waiting for something good to happen to that stock? Um, and, or are you um, at vulnerable because you've paid too much for something bad to happen? And I think it's in a much easier position to be sitting there having looked at all the risks to say, I think that more than likely I'm going to get an upside than a downside going forward in the future on this particular name, given how cheap it is at the moment. So overall, this is um, an old chart, but I think it tells the story of the market. Fair value on this chart is basically the old Fed model. And um, what it's showing you is that the stock market is much more volatile than the underlying fundamentals. GDP, by definition, is GNP. And GNP is basically all the earnings growth of all the businesses in the economy overall. And so that's the underlying fundamentals, but you see stocks aren't necessarily driven by fundamentals. So what's driving them? And I think it's, it's human emotion and human irrationality and speculative behavior as well as depression that gets bought into the marketplace. When you sit back and think about it, 
What's the stock market? It's a place where many, many, many human minds, okay, maybe there's a machine behind it, but ultimately, who was the original investor who said to put money into the market? It was a human who said, now is a good time to get into the market. And so we bring with us ourselves and our emotions, and, they, and that gets embedded in the stock market in multiple ways. And we think that you could take advantage of that human emotion built into the marketplace by having a northern star, a value investing approach. Is this stock cheap relative to its normalized fundamentals? Can I make enough return for this stock just to go back to normal? And then, God forbid, what if it even goes even better than that and I can get an even greater excess return? So to me, that is the real key on, on value investing overall. You know, a lot of people will say, gee, you know, uh, interest rates are an important factor in investing, and I think they are to a certain degree, but you can see, you know, there is some correlations with the peaks and valleys of stock market prices, but it's fairly modest. It's not a really strongly held um, correlation. So there's much more going on in that stock price than that particular underlying fundamental um, in the market. And then I think a lot of people tend to assume that if you could forecast the economy perfectly, then you'd have a good sense of what the stock market would do. Certainly the news organizations think that. When they do their stock reports, they always start with an economic commentary of some kind and what the economy is doing today and what it's about to do overall. But this is um, uh, Canada's own bank credit analyst did this survey of something like um, you know, 17 different countries over 112 years and did a correlation. And they're looking backwards in history so they know exactly what happened with the economy and they know exactly what happened in the stock market. So it's not the forecasting part, it's what happened before. And knowing what happened in the economy, it only explains 17% of stock market behavior. And so having a perfect economic forecast, if you were able to do it, and everyone knows the dismal science of economics, it's very hard to get an, an economic forecast accurate, particularly at major turning points. There's very few economists that predict those major, major turns, and that's probably one of the most critical moments to get it um, overall. So that it's not as a useful a tool as a lot of people seem to think it might be in terms of how to value stocks. So what is going on in the marketplace? And you know, I've been hinting at this all along in terms of human emotions. And when you look at the fullness of history of the stock market, you see that there tends to be these major manias and enthusiasms built into the marketplace that drive stocks up fairly dramatically over a relatively brief period of time in the fullness of history. And then there's these almost longish um, sideways markets. So you get this enthusiasm and excitement and speculation in market. It takes the market to um, often all new highs, as you can see here. And then the market capitulates and consolidates and goes sideways in a very volatile fashion, uh, historically for about a minimum of 15 years before um, the market can take off again. And uh, we just keep seeing this trend over and over. And those so-called sideways markets can be quite volatile um, overall, as you can see in that chart. And what's going on below the surface of this sideways market? So I'm going to look at the last sideways market where we can get it all in its entirety in the uh, 65 to um, 81 time period. And it's the soft gray line is telling a lot of the story. So the blue line is the market. So you get to the far left-hand side of the page, you're seeing you know, the market is going up, and then you're seeing that soft gray line on the far left-hand side of the page. That gray line is going upwards. So the PE multiple is expanding. The game of investing is doing very well. Investors get pretty excited. There's lots of cocktail chatter about making money in the marketplace. So people are pretty enthusiastic. So in order to get in the game of investing, they're willing to pay more and more per dollar of earnings to get into the game of investing, or more, dollar, you know, more dollars per pound um, overall. They take the market up. And, um, and then they hit this 
overall crisis point. No one rings a bell at the top, so no one knows quite what the date is until after the fact. And then the market sort of capitulates and consolidates and goes sideways in a volatile fashion for a period of time. But what's going on below the surface is the PE multiple is contracting. So people are saying, gee, it's harder to make money in the market. We got overpriced. You know, human beings don't like to admit failure, like overpaid for this stock, but you know, instead of selling it a short-term loss right now, if I just hang on to it long enough, hopefully I'll get back to what, what price should I worry about? Oh, maybe if it just gets back to what I paid for it, then I'll feel okay about unloading that name. So we tend to sit on our stocks and they tend to go sideways um, over a period of time. And uh, meanwhile, as you go through economic cycles, slowly but surely, you know, there's earnings growth happening underneath that, that, that period. That's why you see that soft gray line bouncing around a little bit. Um, but uh, eventually the PE multiple falls as the E grows and uh, the stock market overall gets really cheap. And the PE multiple historically when it's really cheap is around a six PE multiple. And then all of a sudden people wake up and smell the coffee and go, oh my goodness, this market's really cheap. I think I can make a lot of money out of it. And then you, you, for various factors or reasons, you start to have a bull market mania. This is a messy chart, and I know you're not supposed to show really messy charts, but it comes from one of my favorite research houses, Ned Davis Group. And uh, so focus first on that middle horizontal pa pa panel. And that is showing you uh, the bond market and uh, when you see green, it means you're making money in bonds. And when you see, uh, uh, so it's a, it's a bull market for bonds. And the most recent period had been a bull market for bonds. We know we had double digit equity returns for bonds as interest rates fell and we were in a deflationary period. And then what I did for convenience is I drew a black vertical line. Um, every time you had the bond market change direction. So when you look back in history, 10-year uh, government bond, bond yields, they'll go up for 20 years, which is inflationary, and, and then they'll go down for 20 years, which is di disinflationary for most of the time. Every once in a while, they go through much longer cycles, which we certainly had. We had bond yields hit an all-time record low in 1941, and then they climb for 40 years until 1981. And because they tend to be symmetrical, they decline for another 20 years. And I think they bottomed in the summer of 2020. And we're now in an inflationary environment. But the reason why I put that vertical line is, is if you go to the top third of the page, it's showing you that when the bond yields change direction, it starts a bull market for equities, usually a few months later or a year later. So sometimes you see it gapping where it flips. And so you swear you, the green is, you see the price level, you see the price level rising. So that's the bull phase, and then the white is the sideways phase. So the bond market sort of leads the equity market um, in terms of entering a sideways market. And a sideways market is both a bull and a sideways for equities. So it's, Keeping that in mind, let's move to the value versus growth story, which is what's happening under the surface for equities as well. And this is the, the century of data from Fama and French. And when you're above the horizontal zero line, that black line is above. That means value is outperforming. And it's, um, each point on that black line is a 10-year average return. So over the prior 10 years, on average, value has outperformed growth. And when the line is below zero, that is when growth outperforms. You're just sitting back and looking at that chart in its entirety, you see that most of the time, value outperforms growth. Now, you're all young adults here, and most of your enthusiasm for investing would have been sometime in the last decade or so. And so you've lived through one of the deepest, longest um, underperformances for value. 
in one of the longest, greatest periods for growth. And you can kind of see this on the chart on the far right-hand side. I've updated the chart in the soft gray line. And, uh, you know, that's the, the deepest, you know, the best outperformance for growth you've seen in that entire century, which meant it was a lot of pain for value managers. And it's lengthy. Now, although it looks like it was a brief period that growth outperformed at the beginning of the chart, just keep in mind that every point on that line represent a 10-year return. So you can see there was at least 15 years of growth outperforming uh, value um, at the beginning of the chart. So, you know, after the 1929 stock market crash, you know, the, the, the opportunity went to the growth, was still with those growth managers in the 10-year return area, and it didn't melt away. Um, until you got to 1941. And um, it was also a disinflationary environment. It was a falling interest rate environment, kind of similar to you know, the aftermath of the, 19, uh, of the uh, 2008 financial crisis and, um, in North America. And uh, we had a crisis as well in uh, 2020, which was COVID. So back in 1941, the crisis was Pearl Harbor. And the next year, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, inflation rate was 9.5%. And post-COVID, we all had dramatically higher levels of interest rates. So it call, those shocks called the end of the disinflationary cycle, and you entered as a, an inflationary cycle. And what you can see on this chart is that all of a sudden, the game flipped away from, from, from growth. And it went to value very dramatically. And from 1941 to 1951, if you take the peak in 1951 and put your eye across the page to the left, you can see it's about a 13% annualized return for a decade of outperformance of value versus growth. And I'll get to the chart later, but it ties up very closely with George's research um, rolling three-year numbers that uh, value outperforms growth when inflation's north of 2.5% uh, by 11% annualized. So very, very uh, similar numbers, basically kissing cousins overall. So it gives you a sense of um, what the future might be. So now that we're in an inflationary environment and we're in the early phases of it, and uh, value managers who had a really tough go of it, they had a few moments of glory in the last decade, but uh, last year, for deep value managers, it was a pretty darn good year. We were all back, thank goodness. And um, if history is any guide, and I like to look at history because I can see you know, humans you know, interacting with financial market data in the past, it's suggesting that there's likely to be a very good period for value coming forward in the future. And gosh, we are very welcoming of it. Um, Southeastern management followed their peer group in the U.S., value managers, and they said AUM for value managers peaked back in 2007, um, about 370 odd billion. And uh, in December of 2021, uh, they take this data off the SEC data sheets for asset managers. And they said the um, AUM is, I think, about $130 billion. So it means that the AUM of asset managers over that period fell 60% on average. So if you talk to most value managers, they lost uh, clients. It was a very brutal period for value. And if you're sitting here in a classroom and you've been studying value, you're about to have a bull market for value analysts, <laughs> if uh, my forecast of the future is correct going forward in the future. Uh, from here. Another basic on investing is the price you pay when you enter an investment has a significant, dramatic impact on your overall results. And so don't pay too much. Go out there and buy cheaply because, you know, just wait for something good to happen for the stock with some level of patience. And how you read this chart is it's looking at a lot of U.S. financial market data going back to 18. Uh, 60, and looking at the 10-year Schiller PE multiple, and then saying, based on um, that starting PE multiple, what was the average return over the next decade? 
and they broke it into decimals. So on the far left-hand side of the page is when the PE multiple was less than six. And you can see that average return, which is that green bar, is the best on the page, about 16%. And the blue band around it is the entire set of examples, the highest and lowest you saw in financial market history of returns um, when you had a PE multiple less than six. Conversely, you go to the far right-hand side of the page um, when it's PE multiples north of 21, the average return was one, and the spread around it is, is modest. And it was one of the worst returns. And God forbid it even had you know, a negative 10-year annualized return uh, for somebody at some point in that history overall. Now, interestingly enough, in 2000, that was one of the most expensive markets we've seen in modern financial market history. And I can attest, having worked in that environment, that um, investors were falling all over themselves to put money into the market in 2000. This was a whole new world, and they wanted to play that speculative game in the new technology.com mania. And I doubt that anybody was throwing money rapidly into the market in that environment would have anticipated that they would have gotten a single total return of 1%. But financial market history exactly predicted what the expected return was going forward um, over the next decade. Today, just to put this into context, I can, I can tell you where Canada, the US, and the global benchmarks sit today, and what it's forecasting for total returns for all those markets, and why I'm so enthusiastic about Canada. The, Cana the Canadian PE multiple is very modest, and therefore we have an expected return going forward of um, six or seven, of, of 10%, sorry, the global benchmark's offering six or seven, and the US market is offering five. So, you know, I, it's a great time for people to be invested in the Canadian economy here uh, today. But this is, oh, it is on this chart. Apologies. It's giving you that, that sense. And then uh, my friend uh, Vitelli Katznelson. He uh, did a, some really interesting math, and I, I'm just trying to underscore the price you pay when you enter an investment has an, in, in, you know, dramatic impact on your long-term results. So you pay too high, you're going to get a very low return for a very long period of time. It's going to really affect your overall portfolio results. If you get a, an over, if you put an overpriced stock or many of them in your portfolio, or you invested your entire life savings all at once at the most expensive time in the market. And uh, so he chose uh, the 1965 high. And so that first year, it was a pretty ugly return. And so then you're spending decades after that trying to recover from that ugly return of putting it in at the worst possible moment in the marketplace overall. And what's really interesting is at the end of the 80s um, and 90s, as you were heading into the uh, 2000s, we had double-digit equity returns. Investors were getting about 18% annualized. You know, they were in interviewing retail investors on, on the streets saying, what is the expected future return of equity investing? And investors were saying, 13%? Isn't that laughable? We kind of would love that today. And, um, but the, the return, the best that investor got was something like 6% return you know, at the best possible after, you know, double-digit equity returns because they'd bought too high at one point. The other thing that's important is your time horizon. And I think this chart captures it quite well. It's showing on the far left-hand side the holding period. So you get into that one-year period. Um, you know, a very small amount of that return is explained by fundamentals, the underlying activities that are actually going on for that stock or economy overall. Um, so they, we call it noise. There's a lot of noise in the short term. But as you get out into a 10-year time horizon, um, if you stick it through, then the fundamentals really shine through on your investment approach or, or for that company. And so that investing with a mind to the long run, and not judging yourself in the short term is important. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to look at this chart because 
most institutional managers are judged on their, th their four to five year time horizon. And if you fall short, you tend to get fired. And, and, and it would be much better to be looking at investors over a 10 year time horizon um, because it's more likely to, to really show off how much skill that manager truly has. So, you know, to me, this, um, this, this preamble is bringing you up to why value investing and, uh, you know, that it, it's the rational approach to investing overall, given all these fundamentals that I've highlighted here. And um, so how do you get an, uh, a value stock out of the marketplace? It's either overlooked, underfollowed, in some sort of trouble, management team maybe shot themselves in the foot or took on too much debt or, or overpaid for an acquisition. And if, but if the management team overall is really good and the financial risk isn't that bad and the risks overall are reasonable or the cyclical risk is just a cyclical risk that will go away when the economy shifts, then if you're a patient investor, you can make money owning value stocks. And the brand of value investing uh, we use in Canada, we call it relative value investing. And uh, we're, we're showing here there's all the different styles of investing. And keep in mind the style box matrix was developed in the US, the deepest, broadest market in the world. Um, most markets around the world are idiosyncratic. They have you know, very, un, very exotic or interesting um, sector um, weights overall. And that makes sense. You know, Ricardo's law of comparative advantage um, states 200 years ago, he understood this, that if you're economic at making something, make a lot of it and export it. And if you're uneconomic at making something, stop making it domestically and import. And he could prove mathematically that your, own, your economy is wealthier and the global economy is wealthier. This is the benefits of trade overall. And so, viva la difference. You want different economies to have totally different sector weights. So you go into the U.S., they have big drugs, they have big technology, they have big consumer products. You come into Canada, it's, it's much more resource oriented. And by the way, almost every market in the world has a very large financial services sector. And you want that, because if you didn't have that, that is the financial plumbing of your economy. So, you know, you'd be a banana republic if you didn't have a financial services sector. So some people complain, Canada's just three big sectors, including financial services. It's like, get over yourself. Everyone has a big financial services sector. Um, but we, we, the other two biggies are, um, are energy and materials. And, and the oddness in Canada is from time to time, the gold sector, I think it's three or four times in my 40-year career, gold has been over 10% weight of the TSX. In the US, it's never more than 1%. So you can be a value manager in the US, you don't have to worry about gold. In Canada, you have to pay more attention to it because it becomes a factor that can really hurt you. So relative value is, I learned over time that I can diminish risk and increase return by stop taking big sector bets. Because Canada is so cyclical, at, from time to time, that cyclical nature of the market could put me really offside what's going on in the overall market. I could be too overweight resources at the wrong moment or too underweight them at the wrong moment, and it could harm performance. I always found traditionally that we were good stock pickers and we got all our brownie points from good stock selection, and we often gave up brownie points due to sector weights by just buying cheapness. And so by, you know, ameliorating that a little bit by having plus or minus 5% sector weights, and that really constrains you in the big, big sectors like energy and materials, um, then you minimize that sector bet problem. And that takes down risk and helps add to returns. So we think it makes a lot of sense in the Canadian marketplace. So how do I, we identify cheap value stocks? Well, we start with a quant model, and we, uh, now there's all these data banks out there. We, we run data through on a very simple formula, um, which focuses on book value, historical return on equity, and relative price earnings multiple, which tend to have a yin and yang with each other. If you kill a book value, the ROE is going to go up by definition, and your 
you know, expected earnings per share are going to go up. So there's a yin and a yang going on, even though there could be wonking around in financial statements. And we like to look at normalized numbers, the long-term averages. We're only asking stocks to go back to where they've been before. We're not asking them to go find new universes. If this stock can just have the same earnings power as it had in the past and has a good corporate culture and a decent management team and it can get back there, um, then I'm more than, I have a pretty high predictability of getting that return. And if, the, um, if that ROE is relatively steady, that company is more forecastable than a company that has very volatile earnings. Then I have to add in more risk factors um, for a name like that. So that, that's a rude, crude, rough and ready ranking machine. We rank the entire universe according to cheapness, and we focus in on the stocks that by and large offer an expected return of 30% or greater. Um, and that you know, means we're looking for a 15% return per annum from each stock. So it, it's um, an efficiency tool, and about approximately 70% of the names in our portfolio come, you know, can be explained by using the quant model. Now, when we start, we start with the identification of ideas, but we still have to put it through the fundamental analysis. The other way we identify stocks is by going, there's some sectors that, you know, earnings focus isn't quite the best way to look at them. Sometimes NAV in some resource companies is a better way to look at it. So we'll use the model. We'll also use a NAV or we'll look more closely at price to cash flow or free price to cash flow. And sometimes you just go out and you go to a conference and you fall in love with a, with a business and a CEO and you think, this is a great company. I'd love to own it. The price is wrong. Well, when you know it, a couple years later, it falls into your zone for whatever reason. It could be cyclical or a little stumble by management team. And you can jump on that stock really fast because you, you already have identified it as an interesting name to buy. So that gives you a sense of how we identify names overall to put them in our portfolio. And then we have to use, we use a structured questionnaire template. Um, we break up the workload into um, industry groups, so people get a sector and the names within a sector or several sectors to analyze. And they are, they are responsible and paid and compensated based on their, their picks. And they're going to write these reports up and recommend where this stock's going and the, the team will vote on it and will evaluate the research report, add feedback and input, and uh, then we decide if it deserves to be in the portfolio and what weight and how we're, what we're going to sell to put it in, and that sort of workload goes on. And we're giving some sense of the kind of questions we build into our questionnaire template because we're trying to look at the company very thoroughly, um, full circle to understand understand it. So we'll look at, you know, what's the competitive advantage of the company? What's its earnings profile? What's its financial risk overall? Um, what, how is it doing on ESG? Is it high risk or low risk overall? Then we move into things like how high could this stock go? How low might this stock go? Those kind of factors are taken into account um, to determine whether we should add this stock to this portfolio at this time. And the end result may well be great company, needs to be five bucks cheaper. Let's see if it happens. And we'll just patiently wait till it gets there and then start relooking at it again. And, and for thorny exits, we'll do another research report again. If we've owned it a long time and we're really kind of, is it, you know, what's, what's going to happen with this? We'll, uh, we'll also do a big full research. Just carrying on the discipline of the process, you know, why 30% um, expected return is a core entry point for a large cap stock. And I think smaller cap stocks are riskier, so you should step back and ask for 40 or 50% expected returns because of that riskiness embedded in them. And um, why is 30% rational? We, um, we take two years consensus earnings estimate because that's all they give you out on Bay Street. Um, and off most data bank services. So we're going to forecast out as far as that's going to give us. We always know there's a positive bias. We take that into account as well um, in terms of looking at the stocks. And so 30, if it's a two-year time horizon, 30% minus two is a 15% expected return per annum from each stock. Why is that rational to look at? Because in the long, long run, almost any equity market, the long-term total return 
is nine and a half to ten and a half percent returns. So 15 minus nine and a half means we built in a five and a half percent margin of safety. A five, let's, we're trying to get a five and a half percent outperformance out of every name. And um, if we fall short, hopefully we still outperform that year, every year. So that's the kind of logic that's going on in the background. And then as, as since we're working together as a group, how do we make decisions? And we use a decision tree um, of consensus. Ideally, we're all rowing in the same direction. We're all value managers. We're all different flavors of it. Um, we don't always agree on everything, but we try to agree as much as possible on, on the fundamentals of a stock. And um, in most cases, we'll all agree, yeah, well, let's buy this stock. But sometimes we get huge divergences. And if that is, happens, then its leader decides with input. And it may well be that I decide the analyst, Sam here, knows more about that stock than I do. She wrote it. She knows more, that there's more je ne sais quoi in her brain than in mine because she's done this huge deep dive on it recently. Um, and so I'll say, okay, whatever you want, go for it. It's your decision, even though the group's divided. Um, or I might have to make the decision, and I, and I will make that decision, and then we, have to, we, we ultimately live with it. And our best example of that was, um, uh, it was BlackBerry, and it had um, been really high, and it had been painful not to own it for a long, long time, and it got really, really cheap. And uh, our analyst looked at it, and he said, he looked at Nokia, and he goes, no, if it's going the way of Nokia, don't touch this name. And there was somebody else going, I've been burned by that name for so many years and I'm finally going to get my chance to buy it and I want to buy it. It was a split vote and I handed it to the analyst and we didn't buy it and it was a good decision not to So, because uh, it fell from that level. So, so here's an example and I just did a public speech uh, a few months ago on Magna. It was $60 at the time, it's $75 today so I altered the, the chart a tiny, tiny bit. and. Um, you know, just uh, showing you some examples on it. Magna in the last, year, now would be in a year, year and a half, was as high as $126 a share. Today in the marketplace, you can buy it for 76. When I did this uh, speech, it was $60 a share. And so I said, well, the expected return, we think the intrinsic value is $95. Um, that's what we are pretty certain it'll get to $95. Might go all the way back up to 126, but we're going to assume it can get to 95 again. You know, in a couple of years, might take a little longer, but we'll see. And um, so that's a 25% expected return from here. Now, when I was doing that, when we bought it, and we were talking about it, it was a much fatter expected return back then. And then we said, what's the downside? We think the downside is 52. You know, if we get this big recession and they can't get parts and they can't sell as many cars as they hope, maybe the stock will get weaker. Obviously, it went higher, but you never know what the future holds. And, um, and then I said, but it goes all the way back up to 126. We're going to make a 65% return. When it was $60, it was basically 100% return. And so then we said, well, if it takes this, you know, if it took 10 years, I could still make 10% per annum, which was a normal stock return um, overall. And then, you know, what are the challenges weighing on Magna? Now, the thing about stocks is, it's really hard to get off the fence. Like on the one hand, you can do that, you get that analysis and that when I was doing that speech, I was going, you could get a 100% return on, on owning Magna. Magna's been around a long time. It's a fabulous auto parts manufacturer. You know, it's, it's sorry, I have to stay by the mics. It's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, best in class. It's the fourth largest producer in the world. It's in multiple countries around the world. Just credit, you know, has almost no debt. It learned about debt years ago. Um, you know, lots of really good positive things. They've, they've converted. They can make the old-fashioned mechanical um, ICE vehicles. They can also make, you know, electric vehicle engines. So they're ready to make the move into the new world. You know, it doesn't matter whether they make A or B engine. They can make money at it, and they're, they can make entire electric cars for some producers. So they're pretty cool. And so that's the exciting part of Magna. But then there's the challenges. And then the risks and the, the fears. And you know, often when a, a decision becomes too hard, what does a real human being do? I know, because I've done it myself. 
I'm doing that research report, I'm writing it, I'm going, oh, 100% return in my portfolio, oh my God, what could it do for our overall returns? You know, it's not getting that kind of return, oh, it's so good. But here's all these risks, there's a war, we don't know when it's gonna be resolved, we've got supply issues, there's, there's you know, these parts that come out of Ukraine, it's really slowing down car parts, you know, like, what if they make a mistake, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then you go, oh, this is too hard. I can't make up my mind what to do. So you just put it to the back of your desk. I'll come back to it tomorrow. But it's too thorny. You don't get back to it. You don't get back to it. I find that by forcing yourself to write that report and come to a conclusion, get off that fence, make a decision, act. Keep acting. Don't, don't avoid dec decision making. And then here I'm just giving you some of the challenges. You could probably dream up more. It's easy to dream up risks, trust me. It's harder to find the good stuff. You know, and the good stuff is limited. It's pretty obvious. And then there's the opportunities, the opposite thing. And uh, we got off the fence and we said, oh, yeah, we're willing to live with Magna at this price, um, where we, we bought it around 60 bucks a share. Still pretty good at 75 Another major part about investing is portfolio construction. Because it's not just stocks. You're building a portfolio of stocks. And... Um, we have a discipline of once a month, we sit down as a team, you know, in this new day of hybrid working, we all come together in one room, we put together a very large document, we try to look at the portfolio and how it's constructed from multiple angles. One of my, uh, our favorite charts to look at is, what's the biggest bet in the portfolio? And we rank the entire portfolio based on bets. So based on your weight in the benchmark, and your weight in the portfolio, what's the differential? And the biggest differential goes to the top of the page, and the smallest differential is on the bottom. And so the, the biggest differential against the benchmark, the biggest overweight, is the stock that's going to have the most impact on your future expected return. So as a CEO, a, C, a CIO, your job is to turn to the analyst, I know your name's Sam, and I'm going to say, Sam! Is this your very, 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 very best idea to make money for clients over the next couple of years? And if she, her body language shrinks, it's not the best idea. We're gonna take that name, we're gonna take that name position down. But if she sits there and pounds the table and goes, absolutely, this is an amazing stock. It has no problems, it has no financial risk, this is gonna make us money, then we we stay where we are. So when you build a portfolio, you go in and you say, based on the risks, we think this stock should be a 3% weight or a 4% weight or a 5% weight. But as the market moves around, as that stock price moves and all the other stocks within your portfolio move around, the weighting of that one name moves around as well. And if you don't force yourself to take a look at that regularly with fresh baby eyes and say, is that weight the right weight for the risks embedded in that stock right at this moment in time? So we put a lot of disciplines in place to make sure that the portfolio at any moment, and you know, coming at it once a month is probably adequate to say, is it constructed based on what the daily trades? Let's keep coming at it once a month and make sure that this is reflecting our best ideas. Or does it need to be traded a little bit? And we do do a number of little trades on the portfolio. Plus we look for new names. We'll scroll data bank services together and decide what is the, what's the future research names that we're gonna add to the template and who's assigning, who's signing up for what report to write for the rest of the group to share going forward in the future. How much position do you have? Like, do you have a highest position if you take a stock? Or the highest? The, oh, the biggest position we have? We do uh, cap weight 10 is the highest. And right now, our probably our biggest position would be a, probably a Royal Bank. But Royal Bank's a pretty hefty weight of the benchmark. And if you're gonna own it, you're gonna you know, you're going to own um, more than what it is. So we're probably a 8% weight in, in Royal today. So that would be our biggest name right now. But on a relative bet basis, it's not at the top of the page. So when a, when a position exceeds your highest limit, I guess, you sell? If, if we do it based on uh, market cap, so what you bought it at. So... Um, based on market cap, it might be a 12% position, but if our, your cost base is a 10% weight, we can hold it if we loved, loved, loved it. 
That, that hasn't been a challenge for investors in Canada for a long time. When Nortel was 36% of the benchmark, that became, a lot of people adopted CAP10, I certainly did um, at the time, so. Um, and it was, it, and by the way, it was very punishing not to own Nortel because it was shooting to the moon back then. It was very painful. Um, but you're seeing some other investors of facing something similar to that during that whole mania we just went through when some stocks rocketed to the moon. But a lot of them are coming down just like they did back in 2000. <laughs> um, then, um, you know, ra risk is important. And on the bottom of the page, I, I talk about the five major forms of risk. Um, cyclical, operational, and financial. Financial is really the worst. Companies go into bankruptcy because they have too much financial risk. So watch that like a hawk. And given that we're now in an inflationary environment, we have gone through a 40-year deflationary environment. Debt burdens have become less and less and less and less and less painful, and so people look at it less. But in the early part of my career, you know, my bosses, they lived with a lot of pain during extremely high inflation. They watched debt burdens. It was a painful impact on profit margins. It's coming, it's coming back. It's hurting businesses. Financial risk is something people have been able to ignore, and we're not going to be able to ignore it going forward in the future. So a good tip right now is get really good at, at looking at debt burdens because a lot of people are probably got themselves trained into not looking at it. Um, so, and then the other one, the two newer ones are ESG risks, which have emerged in a greater um, degree of late, and um, disruption risks. Uh, and so we're looking for those as how big a position are we willing to take in this name? You know, and certainly if the risk levels financially are too high, we won't go there. But cyclical and operational risks, I'll take them any day of the week because that's how good companies get cheap. And it's totally recover recoverable if you have a good management team. Um, so those are real, I consider them gifts overall. And then uh, just the discipline of carrying on on risk. We do have multiple meetings um, through the weeks and, uh, and even once a quarter we do, um, uh, my co-CIO and myself, we sit down and look at the, the overall risks in every single strategy in the fund, make sure they're acceptable levels. And, uh, you know, just talking about responsible investing, we do engagements with companies. Um, we're encouraging management teams to adopt best practices, particularly on guidance. And then um, I'm getting kind of closer to the end of my core presentation here, but I just love to, I'm, I'm a fan of financial market history, and um, I love to share 500-year-old investment advice from a guy named Jacob Fugere the Rich, um, and I call him the original value investor, and this is translated from high German. And he was like the Warren Buffett of his day. He was enormously wealthy, and back in that era, you know, wealth was um, equated with being nobility, and he wasn't. But he did um, make a lot of his wealth by lending money um, to the nobility to fight wars <laughs> and, other, and other investments he made. Um, and it says, divide your uh, fortune into four equal parts, stocks, bonds, real estate, and gold coins. And um, when he says gold coins, it was the currency of the day. So he's kind of talking about T-bills. So I don't want anybody to think that I'm overly enthusiastic about owning a lot of gold, although I think that everyone should own some physical gold um, for you know, challenges. I don't know, I have read um, Wealth, War, and Wisdom, and it's about what is the perfect asset um, if you are in a challenging economic or warlike environment. And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> Um, so diversify as per always. And then um, he was smart enough to say, be prepared to lose on one of them most of the time. So that something will be winning and something will be losing, but that's the benefit of diversifying. So that you still have a nest egg overall. And then he showed from centuries ago that he understood the laws of financial gravity. He understood what inflation and deflation meant and that equities you know, went through both periods, but in somewhat of a mixed fashion overall. And then I think the big advice comes at the end, where he basically says, whenever performance differences cause a, a major imbalance, 
rebalance back to your four equal parts. Now think about that. He's telling you to sell your winners, the thing that's been making you a lot of money, and buy your losers of those four. If anything's been hurting you like the Dickens, put more money in it. And you know what? That is not easy for human beings to do. Like value investing is not easy. I, I, if we want to do this in a QA, and I can tell you how hard the last 10 years has been for value manage, managers. We are the lonely Maytag repairmen of investing today. And we just had a rock'em sock'em year, and I think we've got a decade ahead of us, and we won't be so lonely soon. Um, but in value investing is not a cakewalk. It's not easy. From time to time, you have to endure performance challengers. Um, but you will get seen through those periods with good returns. And I, I learned that in 87. I learned that in 2000. And I think this new generation is learning it right now as we see the speculative mania unwind handing enormous benefits to value today. So why don't I stop here? I do have some more things on macro value investing and on Canada, but uh, I want to be mindful of your time. I'll ask a question okay. first and then... Okay, well, and then I'll do a few charts if, if they're a bit shy. <laughs> uh, so you said the Canadian market is cheap, the low price to earnings. Is it driven by resources? Like, and how does this square with your ESG formula? <laughs> Great. Um, a nice complex question. Well, it's, it's cheap on a PE multiple. It, it was 11, it's now 12, maybe 13 PE multiple. Um, but you see that the, the global is mid-teens and the U.S. is high teens. But we're also half the U.S. price to book value and we're double the U.S. dividend yield. So from you know, multiple value factors, Canada's cheap relative to the rest. So normal PE multiples throughout history are arguably 14 to 16. So when you're 12 or 13, reversion to the mean takes you up. <laughs> for the global, it's flat. And for the U.S., it means pulled down. So the U.S. is um, I have very, very hefty weighting today in the global benchmark. It's 60 or 70 percent. So the upper end of its historic ranges. And, um, and it's squeezing everybody else out. So I think the next largest um, economy in the global benchmark is either Japan or the UK at about 6%. Last time I looked, Canada was the third largest economy in the global um, ASCII All World benchmark. So you're telling, so right now the global benchmark isn't a rational be benchmark for all investors. And a lot of people have moved out of domestic markets into global markets, and no more so than Canada. We have adopted it more than any other country in the world. The average Canadian pension fund today has only a 4% weight in Canada. And yet I think we're about to have a great decade. The last time Canada was this cheap relative to the U.S. back in 2000, Canada outperformed the U.S. by um, over the next 11 years. And Canada outperformed the U.S. by, by 8%. Uh, no, the, the global by 8% over that time period and the uh, U.S. by nine, annualized. So it was a pretty big differential. And uh, we think, you know, you saw last year, Canada had a very significant relative outperformance against the U.S. and so far year to date. So more of that. There was a second part to that question. I missed that. Ready? You had a, a first I, 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 You know, I said, you know, maybe the P is so low because of the earnings of the resource stocks. And yeah. then ah, the if you're a supporter of ESG, I guess, yeah. what does they say about your yeah. ESG? You know, it's really interesting. We, had, we were challenged performance-wise by not owning the tech stocks. And then, you know, last year, you know, we outperformed the benchmarks um, in all of our strategies between 9 and 19%. So that was pretty nice. Nice comeback after a tough uh, go for value. And, of course, what do some people say? Well, you got about 5% return from Shopify. That was so, such a gimme. Excuse me? I earned that 5%. I took a lot of pain for a lot of years not owning Shopify. Excuse me. 
And then the other one was, well, you probably got a lot from having energy. Well, yes, we were market weight energy, and we did benefit by choosing names well in that sector. But that represented only half of the outperformance. We got outperformance across the board in every sector out there. And so, you know, we weren't just a one-trick pony overall. So that's my one argument against it. And, and, I, and what I'm finding really fascinating today is I've been using a model consistently for, for 35 years. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty used to that model. And, you know, how many stocks are offering me a 30% expected return at one point in time? I've got well over 50 names. There are t points in time where I might have four or five names that offer me a 30% expected return. And with the risk factor embedded in them, I don't want to own any of them. So this is, there's a lot of cheapness still embedded in the market across several sectors. There is a bit of a focus on, on, on some in particular. Um, there's resources to some degree are still showing up. Certainly financial services is very attractive here. But you know, at any moment in time, there's always management teams out there shooting themselves in the foot, making mistakes, and getting cheap in the marketplace from almost every sector. And you can scoop in and take advantage of them. And in terms of the ESG issue, the North American um, you know, resource producers um, are really decent corporate citizens. We're producing cleaner energy than China is, than many other countries in the world. And you know, be, you know, we've recently had greater use of coal out there in the world, um, and and yet there's really um, pretty decent natural gas available in copious quantities in Canada. And I, you know, we we're now flipping from a an enormous focus on on transitioning energy to energy security, because. No, you know, companies are being punished if they invest in um, replacing their reserves. And now the world's becoming more and more worried that the energy tra transition is reasonably slow. Um, the last, I, I think a year or so ago, it was only 4% transition. And um, so we've got a long ways to go in terms of energy transition. And if we cut off the supply of traditional forms of cleaner energy, um, we may have problems going forward in the future. We had people very worried in parts of Europe if it had been a cold winter. So uh, we're, we're, and of course, when we invest, we're trying to buy the better players in the marketplace. Um, we actually are running a fund, um, the Resource Evolution Fund, where we're investing in mostly North American energy company, you know, resource companies. But our thesis is those that are improving their ESG um, will have stock price appreciation. So far, that's playing out. Any other questions? Um, kind of building off your last point just there, I think in one of your first few slides, you mentioned that like, despite all of this, it's still important to consider like government, political factors, uh, what else might be going on in the economy and social trends. Um, to what extent do you feel that impacts the thesis you just mentioned on like um, energy being, uh, you know, potentially like attractive in the next few years or the next even like 10, 15 years, given maybe from like a political or government perspective, there's like to what extent do those uncertainties potentially hinder um, the performance maybe of like our energy sector? Yeah, you know, and that's a good question. It's a good question in terms of um, human excess in stock market pricing. If you recall in April of 2020, Oil very briefly went to negative $35 a barrel. And the commodity price was trading around $25 a barrel. Um, it was clearly very, very inexpensive. Um, and it created an opportunity, but we had, you know, um, um, a lot of enthusiasm going in the opposite direction. And um, a lot of punishment. Uh, by investors to be present in that sector. So it was a, a challenging sector to continue to invest in, particularly if it had hurt your portfolios previously. But this is what contrarian value investing does. We are contrarian by nature. You have to go against the crowd to make money. You have to not do what's popular because what's popular is priced in already. It will not make you money. So when you see that the crowd has gone too far on a theme, 
it's usually worthwhile saying, is this cheap? And, you know, the, the energy stocks were very cheap. And it was uh, worthwhile to be there, and it was worthwhile to be carefully additive to it. Um, and, you know, carefully in terms of being very mindful of being in the best quality names with the best, um, you know, focus on environmentalism. And, and Canadian companies, by and large, have not pounded their chest enough about the money and effort they've, they've taken to be good, good, uh, looker, good, uh, good job of looking after the environment overall. Um, Hi. Um, thank you for, for your time today. Uh, just a quick question. In terms of um, your screening method, you talked about how one of them was looking at companies that are going through something and management made a stupid mistake. Uh, what are some things that give you confidence that the management team will not make another stupid mistake and just drive it further into the hole? Right. No, it's a good question. So it's partly through, you know, there's this, this tension of it's easy for people to fall in love with managements, actually. So you want to analyze the stock first before you expose yourself to management. But sometimes I'll just go out to management meetings and just sit there to absorb it and learn and come back later. Um, through experience, sometimes you kind of go, I really like this management team. They really seem to be managing the company really well. They're really involved in the operations and they, they seem to be really on top of everything and focusing on all the right things. Um, so, but you, you also want to caution yourself from falling in love with a management team and then not seeing what they're doing wrong. Um, it's, there's an art and a science here, and you can't get everything into a science, that's for sure. Um, I know a lot of people want to make everything into a science, but um, that's not possible. Um, it's a judgment call that you think the management team's good enough and you think that the business is um, stable enough and that they've been honest enough up till now and that they're honest about the problem. They don't seem to be hiding it and they're admitting their mistake and they're reversing and they're trying to solve it. So there's a judgment call there that you think that that's a temporary mistake that they can overcome. But the, the big one is, is there isn't a lot of financial risk embedded in the firm at the time. So that they have, they have time to figure it out. But for me, it's always, is the price so juicy enough I can afford to wait a little bit? Uh, and just a quick follow-up to that. Uh, another one of your screens was it being misunderstood. Sorry, misunderstood. Um, and so at that point, you, you're thinking about what the timeline is for the market to understand the business. Um, and so I'm just wondering how you go about thinking about that. Can you repeat that question again? Because I didn't quite get your question in it. Yeah, so on that filter list, uh, you talked about... On my filter list? Yeah, when you're screening for a value stock. Yeah. Um, one of them was the company's misunderstood. Um, and so... I'm, I'm just wondering, when you're looking at a company that is misunderstood, um, how are you thinking about the timeline that the market decides and finally understands the company? <laughs> well, you actually hit on the, the, the core of value investing, which is that it's cheap, and uh, you think the market misunderstands the company, and um, you're smart enough to buy it, and then you expect the rest of the market to finally get smart enough to buy it too, <laughs> take the price up to get you out of it. Um, so, so your question is, how do I know it's misunderstood? Well, sometimes it's, um, there's such a pile-on of hate um, or a pile-on of love um, that's so overdone that it seems a bit irrational. Um, and I think some of the energy stocks for a while there fit that bill. Um, but uh, sometimes there's a certain level of complexity to the firm and people can't seem to get their head easily wrapped around it or it's an extraordinary extraordinary business so that it allows it to be misunderstood um sometimes you get odd things like um a company has um high um insider ownership and it has a a really low float and and so therefore it falls off screens, people don't realize how big it is. And I would say Imperial Oil sometimes hits that. A lot of people don't talk about Imperial Oil. Um, they tend to overlook it because even though it's bigger than Suncor, it, doesn't sh it, it looks like it's a lot smaller because it has 
a small float, and so it tends to not get focus, and it doesn't use investment bankers. That's the other thing. If you um, don't raise capital and you don't need investment bankers, you don't tend to get as much write-ups on Bay Street or Wall Street, and because of that, you tend to get more overlooked and underfollowed, and, um, you know, it puts a cloak of invisibility around a stock, and that doesn't mean it's not a good stock. Um, and that you can't make money on it. But it can make it cheap, and because of that, you can make money. So, um, or smaller cap stocks are overlooked and underfollowed because they're small cap and they're overlooked and nobody's looking at them. Like, I think you pro there's probably a great opportunity in value small caps right now because they've been underwater for so long and they haven't fully come back much. And um, they've been underwater for a very long time, so... They've got a head of steam to come back, and they could be a great opportunity. But they're overlooked now because nobody's made money, and like I think value's overlooked right now. And uh, right now, a number of value managers have had an incredible year last year, and you would think new money would be finding them. But I just wrote a piece about you know how it's a regime change, but the market isn't accepting that it's a regime change yet, and the assets haven't moved. Um, they're sticky. They're staying in the old camp. And um, I think they eventually will move. They, and that's part of being overlooked. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim, for coming. I've got a question for you about patience. Um, how do you know you've, or do you have a discipline around, you know, value hasn't surfaced? Uh, how much time do you give something? And related to that, for an idea, and related to that is patience of your clients. So how, what kind of work do you do? to make sure that your clients are also going to be patient enough for value to surface. Thank you. Uh, all right, indeed, and I think we all learned that recently. Um, you know, managing uh, this field is not just about being um, an introvert who sits there and picks stocks quietly in a room. Um, in order to get assets to manage, you've got to woo clients. <laughs> and. Um, and part of it is setting expectations correctly. And, uh, and it's about being up front with your clients and saying, we're going to try and do our best to get you a decent return on an annual basis, but I can't guarantee that. And so when you have a year where you don't have a great result, you go, remember at the beginning we talked about how <laughs> we get, you got to get them nodding with you. That's part of the game. That, you know, the style won't be there, but that, in the long run, you do get those returns, and you expect to get it. And um, and then as part of the game is to keep talking them, you know, keep wooing them and giving them as much information as you can to get them to help hang in. Um, but it, it's very helpful if you choose your clients well. And some clients come, and they are already huge value believers, and they're the best. But... The other thing that's really hard on this front is when our numbers are the worst and we're underperforming the most, that's the best time to win clients. It's the hardest time to get them in the door, but if they get in the door then, we, we, I do a chart and it looks at the rolling four-year track record over time, and I actually map all my clients on there. And if they came in at a top, let's say we were outperforming by 3.5% and they got excited by that over a four-year period and they put money in, well, I'm a bum until I get a 35 or better return in the future because otherwise I didn't make any money for them because they bought up here. But if a client buys us when we're underperforming by a couple percent, then if we go back to our normal outperformance of 1.5 or 2 They've had a huge win, and, and the only time I look like a bum is when we're underperforming a lot again. But it's so hard to win clients then. Sometimes I'm lucky because a client will want to buy you when you're outperforming, and you might fall off really quickly, and they, they didn't get the money to you right away, and the money hits you down here. And then they're great clients because for a long time, your since inception number always looks so good. It's incredible how powerful that since inception number is. You'll see, I, I launched um, a, a deep value fund in the summer of 2020. I wrote a piece called Waiting for Dawn, 
And it was like waiting for the value to come back, please. And I was pointing out how close we were and I thought it was coming soon. And I decided if this is the worst period for value in a hundred, a century of value data, that this is when I want to launch a fund and I want my track record to start at the worst possible moment because it's going to look damn good afterwards. So um, if you can convince people to come in at the worst of times, that's going to really help your relationship with them. It, but it's extraordinarily hard to do. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask a question about your idea on investing heavily in Canada. Specifically, how do you think about managing currency risk when uh, having more exposure to a certain geography? What was the last part? The managing risk? Managing the, the currency risk that comes from holding uh, you know, significant holdings in a specific geography, I guess, compared to a currency U.S. dollar. Risk. There's, why Canada now? One is we talked earlier about how cheap Canada is. And therefore, it's an opportunity. It has a better expected return than the other markets. But we're also in an inflationary environment. And this is showing Canada against a number of different asset mix or asset classes. But I've highlighted Canada versus the U.S. And you can see here Canada performs the U.S. by about 8% annualized the last five times that inflation was north of 4%, which we are north of today. And that's pretty close to the outperformance we saw last year, Canada, relative to the U.S. So as long as, so now we're in an inflationary environment, you know, Canada should do better than the U.S. And it's partly due to commodities. Like in the currency, Canadian currency is lower now. And people are, you know, I was on TV yesterday morning and it was like, oh, woe is us, you know, Canadian currency is down. Well, it's tough for us if we go on vacation. But we're a resource-based economy. This is good. We, we are one of the most dependent nations on exports. The, the Americans just gave us a gift. You know, we, have, we didn't have to act that hard for this, but we now have, you know, a, a low currency. And so the net back on every dollar of oil is good. And we sell a lot of oil to the rest of the world in U.S. dollars. This, I'm, I'm, I, you know, this is not necessarily bad. Now, the Canadian currency is cheap relative to history, and over time it'll revert back, and that'll have some, there's always a yin and a yang, an opportunity and a challenge. Um, but uh, th this is my other favorite chart, which is for a value investor. And this is George's chart, <laughs> and I think George should use this way more. <laughs> because, you know, it's a, both a value story and, a, you know, and I was doing the Canada story, but this is the value story. You know, value outperforms growth when inflation's north of just 2.5%. Well, we got inflation in the U.S. around 6% today. And we have central bankers having a heck of a time getting it lower. But, you know, Bank of America did a study recently that showed that over the last 40 years, every time inflation got in north of 5 in a developed nation, on average, it took 10 years to get it back to 2 like once that inflation genie gets out of the ball, it's really hard to put back. And so, you know, it, the expectation is rational that inflation is going to be hard to get back to two. And George is pointing out here from his 100-year study that when inflation is north of just 2.5%, value beats growth by 11% annualized against a growth uh, uh, manager. So this is a great time to be in value, and this is one of the reasons why I've been saying um, in this meeting with some level of confidence that I think that we've got a pretty good time horizon for, for value here um, because we're now in an inflationary environment. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Saying like it's an uh, inflationary uh, period right now, but then, you know, the one of the most uh, important issues around the world right now is the central bank trying to raise interest rate. And, you know, in downtown Toronto, there are many high-rise buildings. And with uh, interest rates goes higher, and then it's more expensive to borrow money f to sustain those real estate uh, development, as well as all those uh, technology companies uh, trying to, you know, work from home, people can work from home. So, that, so those high-rise buildings will become empty. So... Um, in Canada, I think real estate is one of the most important sectors uh, that uh, constitutes the whole uh, Canadian economy. So what are your views on 
even though the inflation data shows that if inflation is still above 2.5, you know, there's still a lot of return, but what the central banks are doing, they are trying to tame the uh, interest rate, uh, sorry, tame the inflation. So with their continued effort in uh, maintaining the high inf uh, interest rate, so what, if, what is your view on the long-term uh, real estate uh, and then induced to the can Canadian economy? Well, right now, Canadian um, interest rates are lower than the U.S. by about point, you know, 60 basis points. And we're certainly lower than a lot of other places in the world. So it's, we're not, we don't have it as painful as a lot of other places in the world. That's one point um, overall. Um, we also have um, a significant immigration policy. And if you're worried about Toronto in particular, there seems to be a fair number of those immigrants wanting to live in the city of Toronto. So, um, you know, I think that that deals with that problem to some degree as well. If you start stop building, we'll very rapidly have a lack of housing supply, and governments are really worried about that. But you know, there's a lot of interesting in issues around that whole interest rate thing. Is that if, when you look back at history, runaway inflation is probably one of the hardest things on a society. You know, you look at Weimar, Weimar, Weimar Republic in Germany, or if you look at Zimbabwe, those those economies are really struggling hard. And so you've got central bankers trying to be independent of the political issues um, and saying our job number one is to moderate inflation and not let it get crazy. And we're going to stay on this job. But meanwhile, they're receiving a lot of political pressure. And political pressure is people trying to get reelected by listening to what people want. And people don't want high interest rates. So there's this tug of war going on. But if you look at what happened in the 70s, when Nixon um, went to Burns and said, I got an election to win, and I'm fighting this Vietnam War, like, uh, can you give me a break here so I can get reelected? And he let him have a break. And then we had crazy inflation that went up to 18%. So the central bankers are smart, you know, saw what happened then and said, we have to keep on this game no matter what. And then inflation will be able to will be able to pull it back, but in history, based on the current levels of interest of of inflation that we have now, historically in the U.S. in the 70s, the 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 actual interest rate was seven. We're actually pretty lucky. Um, we're not anywhere near that yet. You know, the U.S. is not even four, um, but the U.S. is targeting to get up to four and a half to five, because they think that's what it's going to take to stop inflation from getting running away. And I think we have to take a little bit of a medicine pill here. Um, but when you look at the consumer, there is a lot of cash still. And the banks have been very careful about um, their lending practices, and they're fairly confident they won't have to take too many losses there. Um, and Canadians tend to pay off their mortgages. It's a societal norm in our society. Um, so. So far, so good. It is a challenge. It may not be as bad as we f you fear, but time will tell. Thank you for the question. I'm no expert on top down like that, but thank you very, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, from your experience, was there any particular industry of value stocks that have been kind of outperforming value stocks in general, or was it more so like company specific? You're, it's whether there's sectors that are better for value than others. Hmm. Any sector gets to a point where value can work from time to time. Um, you know, some things get overdone on the upside, and they also get overdone on the downside. And even at the bottom of the uh, the tech. You know, the dot-com mania at the end, it was, it was worthwhile to buy some tech stocks um, back then. Um, in a moment in time, you can say there's more value stocks in these sectors because you can see them standing out. But five years from now, there'll be a whole different sector that will provide the, that opportunity. Um, I will say, though, that the more stable earning companies, the, the companies with more predictable... ROEs and, um, and earnings per share growth, 
the, the tighter that ROE is, like let's say the upper end is 12% and the lower end is eight. So the average is 10. And you know, if, if that's the norm, then I would make a bigger bet because I'm much more comfortable that it'll get to at least 10 from an eight. Um, if, the, if the swing on ROEs is really big, um, forest product stocks come to mind. <laughs> They go double digit negative to double digit positive, you know, when the cycles are moving. The midpoint is much less predictable. And I would consider that riskier and I would take smaller bets. I don't know if that helps you, but great. Thank you. But right now the banking sector looks particularly cheap and some of the consumer stocks are looking quite cheap today as well. And the odd, I, you have to be careful in the commodity sector but there's a bunch in there too. But you, they come with dragons, so you want to pay a lot of attention. Thank you for the presentation. Um, looking at this chart here is really interesting. I was wondering what your thoughts are on like being a more like dynamic investor and kind of switching from growth to value depending <laughs> on the time period. You know, that's a great question because a lot of people go, "That's what I'm going to do." <laughs> but um, uh, let's use Shopify as an example. So um, November of 2021, Shopify was going from strength to strength and really high prices. Um, you know, how many people who were in a growth stock like that felt it was time to get out? Because you'd had value managers for several years saying, it's almost over, it's almost over. And those tech stocks kept soaring. And um, so, you know, how many would you, if you wanted to adopt that game, would you have known to sell uh, Shopify before November 18th? Because the game changed because of one thing, in my opinion. All of a sudden, virtually in the same week, central bankers around the world said, oops, inflation is not transitory, we're worried and we're gonna start taking action. And they didn't take action for months, but from, you know, that was the top of Shopify. And, you know, we know it went down 70% at its worst. Um, it's back up a little bit from there. Um, would you have switched the game? And yet the fall off on that and some other names is so dramatic when it goes, you know, where you're gonna give up a bunch of return there. Um, it's very hard. If you, I like to look at the, the, um, the reality, like who has become famous and made a lot of money by switching styles? Like which firm out there does it and is known for it and is good at it and knows when to switch games? And um, I know of none. And uh, most uh, consultants will put you in a style box matrix and say, you're doing large cap value. You move off that, we'll fire you. You're doing large cap growth, you move off that, we're gonna fire you. We know you're good at this. We're not sure you're good at that. So it's, it's an interesting notion. Um, at a, if you're an asset mix person, you might, if you're sharp enough, you can kind of ebb and flow the value versus growth. But I'm talking to my value peers and going, we all had, most of us had a really good year last year. We're doing okay right now. And I go, so getting lots of new money? Oh, lots of kick in the tires, lots of people are talking to us, but no, we're not winning a lot of business yet. Um, so I don't think a lot of people practice it, but I think it is an interesting notion. I'm just not sure that anyone has that skill base to know when to make that flip. You know, when is this game over? And, uh, but. Just to follow up, I guess. Um like a, the, a few of the unicorns like Amazon and like Microsoft, like those kind of companies that were trading at high PE values and have generated outsized returns. What are your thoughts on like passing on those kind of companies? What do I think on the which kind of on, on like passing a company like that with like- Not that owning have, it? Yeah. Um, I lived through 2000. Um, and I believe only two of the top stocks in 2000 ever went back to their market cap highs. And if you also put into context that the, um, the average tenure of a stock on the S&P 500 is 20 years, 
you start going, hmm. Uh, you know, I've seen people get overly enthusiastic on the earnings growth. And um, if we're in an inflationary environment for 20 years, it's going to be very hard for them to get back to those um, highs. Because what you're doing is you're taking that forecasted earnings growth and you're discounting it back at a much higher interest rate. And the present value is a lot lower. And um, so even if they have that growth and you're in that inflationary environment, are they ever going to be worth what they were at that peak? And I, I suspect not. And there might be one or two extraordinary ones. And if you're good at identifying it, power to you. But even the, the best ones, it generally takes, and this is, you can look back in the 70s and the same mania, the, the mania of the nifty 50, and the handful that did come back, like, you know, McDonald's is still a decent size firm today, you know, Disney. But, you know, in their examples, they took about 15 to 20 years to go back to their market cap highs. But most of them never come back. So you might get lucky if you identify the right one. Thank you. Most important thing, life and investing, you learned over the last 30 years. Uh, there's so many lessons and there's so few that are so big. Um, and uh, I, I think it comes down to, in investing, I think it's about having a guiding light. And for me, the one guiding light is the price you pay when you enter that investment. That is just so critical. But I, it's about how do you survive a career. Um, it's the compounding of value over time that really creates wealth for you and for your clients. So it's, it's playing that game for the long run. And it's a tough road to hoe. And I got to tell you, it was, like, it was incredibly challenging for any value manager to survive the last 10 years. Just you know, beating your head against the wall to a certain degree. Um, so you have to have a way to keep it fresh, to give yourself baby eyes, to keep finding the wonder in the world, to put a kaleidoscope and looking at the market through new lenses to keep your enthusiasm, your creativity fresh and alive and, and keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep on that game. Um, so I think that applies to the investing. And then personally, it's about have fun. Like make games out of things, you know. Um, you know, I get excited about lots of things. Like, you know, I got a phone call today. Would you like to go and talk to a client in Monaco? Yes, I would. Um, you know, I got invited last week to speak at Columbia University, and I said, the home of Ben Graham. Yes, and I told everyone in my social circle. I am going to Columbia to speak. I'm so excited. Um, you know, you know, you don't. You can make it. Oh well, I'm just talking to students at Columbia, or I'm just talking to students at the best value investing school in the world. And uh, but it's not. It's exciting. And I, you know, you make it fun. You make. You can make everything fun. You can turn everything into a game. And and. Uh, you know, I get challenged. I got I get asked, "Would you like to do? Uh, you, would you like to do a debate? Um, will active management beat? Uh, will artificial intelligence beat active management anytime soon?" And I said, "I haven't a clue what the answer is, but I want to know." So I took I took on the challenge, and then I figured out the killer argument, and uh, and I won the debate twice. We redid it twice. Um, so that's making it fresh. That's keeping it alive. And that's fun. So thank you. Thanks, George.